Hello, Mark here. Before we begin today's episode, I would just like to quickly take the time to ask all of those who are enjoying the series a favour. If the platform you use to listen to Castings for Ancient Greece has a rating or review system, I would be extremely grateful if you would consider leaving the series a quick review. These ratings and reviews go a long way into helping others discover the show, in turn helping it grow. So if you enjoy the series and can spare a few minutes, I would love to read what you have to say about your experiences with the show. Thanks everyone for your support, and let's get to today's episode. As for Ephialtes, who was a terror to the oligarchs and exorable in exacting accounts from those who wronged the people, and in prosecuting them, his enemies laid plots against him and had him slain secretly by Aristodicus of Tanagra, as Aristotle says. Taken from Plutarch's Life of Pericles. Hello, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 58, Shifting Sands in Athens. We now find ourselves at a point where the tensions between Athens and Sparta were at their height since before the Greek and Persian War. There had always existed a mutual suspicion of one another which would influence how they responded to events. As we have seen, the growth of Athens' power with the creation of the Delian League and its subsequent campaigns would heighten Sparta's suspicions. For at the outbreak of the Greco-Persian War, Sparta had enjoyed a position as being recognised as the most powerful city-state on mainland Greece. Though, with Athens' growth and importance, especially as a naval power, she would come to challenge this notion with many other smaller Greek polis, viewing them as an alternative as leaders for a united Greek league. This would be realised in the creation of the Delian League in the wake of the Greek victory over the Persians on the Anatolian coast. This post-invasion period would see the various interests of the city-states come to the forefront and shaping policy now that the common enemy had been defeated. Spartan leadership within the Greek world had been challenged and now saw them having to accept that there was another power on the block. We saw that the interactions between Athens and Sparta during the following decade would see them both manoeuvring to establish policies that would be in their best interests. Within these policies was a major factor of how the two cities would deal with one another with their overlapping interests. As we saw, it was difficult for us to establish a clear picture of how Sparta directed its relations towards Athens. Though we did see there appears to have been competing factions within Sparta that viewed this matter differently. In Athens, we saw two main factions form where one under Themistocles would attempt to move Athenian interests aggressively at Sparta's expense, while Chimon would look to further Athenian interests while also preserving the peace between the two cities. We also found our sources stressing the pro-Spartan stance Chimon took, with even naming one of his sons after the region of Laconia. Though both polis would eventually settle into a position of coexistence once Themistocles, who had been stirring trouble up on the Peloponnese, was ostracised. However, over the last two episodes, we have seen how through the unfolding events, this position would shift to one of open hostility. The path to this position would begin with the Athenian siege of Thassos, where Sparta would enter into a secret agreement to attack Athenian territory. Though a powerful earthquake would see that this attack would not eventuate. Sparta would then face more troubles with their helot population rising up, arranged into an open rebellion. Sparta would call on the Peloponnesian and Hellenic leagues to gain assistance where a number would answer the call. Athens would be one of the cities to march to Sparta's aid, but would be sent away not long after arriving. Suspicions would be seen to be at the core of this decision, which appeared to have bubbled to the surface and been acted on in a much more hostile manner than before. This would mark a breakdown in relations seeing Athens now dissolve its membership in the Hellenic League and form alliances with the cities hostile to Sparta. For this episode, we are now going to turn to focus on Athens during this period, as it would come to be a major shift in Athenian politics and see the path to direct or radical democracy. To do this, we need to introduce ourselves to two influential political figures that would drive this change, Ephialtes and Pericles. We will then look at their efforts in bringing about change while Chimon was still popular in Athenian politics, where we will then see the point this popularity disappeared and how his opponents took advantage of this and what changes they were making. This will then see us witness Chimon's ostracism from Athens, where Ephialdes and Pericles with their supporters would be firmly in control of Athenian politics. Though, we will see these changes were not celebrated by all, as there would be an episode of political violence. However, this would see Pericles come to be one of the youngest men to dominate Athenian politics. 
Let's now meet our two Athenian political figures that we have been recently hearing about in Athenian developments. First, we will start with Ephialtes, who would be the main driving power behind the opposition to Cimon's policies. I have to say straight up that we have very little information on Ephialtes' early life, and he would only remain in a prominent role in Athenian politics for a short period, seeing that what we do have on him as limited. Unfortunately for us, he would not be given the same treatment Plutarch extends to other famous Athenian political figures, such as Themistocles, Cimon, and Pericles. However, in Plutarch's life of Cimon and Pericles, we do get some insight into Ephialtes, due to him being Cimon's main rival and an ally of Pericles. While the Athenian constitution, attributed to Aristotle, also features Ephialtes, since that text's purpose is to outline the evolution of Athenian politics, and Ephialtes would see democracy advance, in what is often called radical democracy, an idea that democracy is always an unfinished process. The only bits of information relating to Ephiotes' life before leading the opposition to Cimon is that according to Diodorus, he was the son of Sophonides, who we have no information on. He also hears through Aelion, a Roman teacher of rhetoric writing in the early 3rd century AD, that Ephiotes was amongst a list of important political figures in Athens who were not wealthy. This may well be true, but it had appeared that Athens during the Greco-Persian Wars had backpedaled a little with its reforms being that political power had been swinging back towards those in the aristocratic class. This assumption on his wealth may be looking to his support of extending more political power to the lower classes, while it would also provide a contrast to his opponent, the very wealthy Cimon, a theme very popular in stories. Though at the end of the day, we have no idea of his wealth status, I just wanted to point out a couple of things before we take these comments written down hundreds of years later on face value. Finally, the last bit of information that we have on Ephiotes before his time in the limelight would be that it appears he had been elected strategos at around or just after the victory over the Persians at the Eurymedon. Through Plutarch, we would hear that he and Pericles would command fleets that were operating in the Aegean from just after this. This would be the earliest reference to him holding an office this high, but it appears this would be the beginnings of building his political influence now that he had entered onto the stage of Athenian political power. This, though, would be about the extent of what is known about Ephialtes before he would enter onto the pages of history, through his interactions in opposing the most popular political figure of the day, Cimon. Our next political figure that we will introduce this episode, and would come to dominate this new phase of Athenian politics, would have much more written about his life. A big factor for this would be due to the man, Pericles, coming to control the political landscape in Athens for a number of decades. For most of the information on Pericles, we rely mostly on what Thucydides writes, though he is mostly concerned with him as a statesman and his involvement in Athenian politics. Something we need to keep in mind as we continue on is that Thucydides paints Pericles in an extremely positive light and avoiding any criticism of him. Our other major source of information comes from Plutarch, who writes a biography of him amongst other important Greek and Roman figures. But like always with Plutarch, we need to remember he was writing in the early 2nd century AD, over 500 years after Pericles' time. While as we have seen, Plutarch is also fond of relaying anecdotes of the figures he writes about. Pericles was born somewhere around 495 BC in Athens. The precise year is uncertain, but give or take a couple of years gives us a rough estimate. He was the son of Xamphippus, who we have met through our episodes covering the Greek and Persian Wars and the developments afterwards. His mother, Agorist was the grandchild of Chrysostomus, the man who took control of Athenian politics after Hippias the tyrant was driven from power. Plutarch would share a short antidote about his birth, saying, His mother, being near her time, fancied in a dream that she was brought to be of a lion, and a few days after was delivered of Pericles. This would see Pericles a part of one of the noblest families in Athens, the Acmeonidae. His childhood would be dominated by the Persian invasions, with the Battle of Marathon taking place before he had yet reached 10 years of age. This would then see him grow up through his teenage years with the threat of further Persian aggression and then Xerxes' invasion. During the period leading up to the 480 invasion, his father, Xanthippus, would become a political opponent of Themistocles and would become the victim of an ostracism. This would see Pericles depart Athens with his family, seeing that they would be absent from politics for 10 years. Had Xanthippus' ten years been fulfilled, this could have altered Pericles' path, 
as his father would not have entered back into Athenian political life during the influential years after the defeat of the Persian invasion. Though the crisis of Xerxes' invasion would see that all that had been ostracised were recalled to Athens in 480. We would hear that as Pericles developed through his teenage years and into early adulthood, he would be somewhat of a contrast to Cimon. Cimon had been known to be a very sociable man and enjoyed indulging in gatherings. Pericles, on the other hand, comes across as an introvert, devoting himself to pursuits of the mind. Obviously, the reason he could do this in the first place was due to the wealth of his family. We hear through Plutarch he would become very proficient in music, having learnt from a master of musicology, Damon. Though it is thought that his teachings went further than this, with it often thought that he may have influenced Pericles' decision to pay jurors for their service. We would also hear that Pericles would be one of the first political leaders of Athens to put a heavy amount of thought into philosophical ideas, where he would be known to interact with Protagoras, Zeno, and Anaxagoras, all being pre-Socratic thinkers, pre-Socratic referring to the range of thinkers before the time of Socrates. Of these philosophers, it would be Anaxagoras who would have the largest impression on Pericles' early thinking. We find Plutarch commenting on their association as Pericles being lifted up beyond simple superstitions with an understanding of the occurrences in the skies above. Anaxagoras is known for his thinking of the natural world and the cosmos, where he developed a theory on everything around his existence. Though this period could be a dangerous time to call into question the gods and the supernatural, especially if you had political opponents. We would hear later on in Pericles' career, he would ensure Anaxagoras would get out of Athens safely during a period where thinkers were beginning to be put on charges of impiety. So this would be some of what we know about Pericles as he reached an age where he would enter into Athenian politics. He wouldn't burst onto the political scene, but appears to have taken a cautious approach. This had been a time where those who misjudged their attempt at gaining influence in the assembly could risk being put up for ostracism, their more powerful political opponents picking off their would-be competition one by one. Pericles also being from such a noble and wealthy family would have also already been held in suspicion by the ordinary voting citizens of Athens. Now by around the mid-460s, the situation in Athens saw that a credible challenge to Cimon's policies had now presented itself. But as we saw, and we will see this episode, Pericles would not initially take a leading role in opposition to Cimon, but would fall in behind Ephialdes with his support. Having looked at both Ephialdes and Pericles' background, let's now get back to events we had been covering. We saw that opposition against Cimon had made itself known in the sources around the Thassos campaign, where he was accused of corruption and not taking advantage of Athens' victory and failing to expand into Macedonian lands. Here we would see history almost repeat itself, though through a new generation of the same families. Cimon's father, Miltiades, had also been put on trial with a charge of treason for actions around the siege of the island of Paros. During his trial, Pericles' father, Xanthippus, would be arguing the case against him. This would result in Miltiades being sentenced to death, though with this reduced to a large fine that Cimon would come to inherit. Now it would be the sons of both Miltiades and Xanthippus that would find themselves in the same position, Plutarch telling us Pericles would be the most vehement of Cimon's accusers. Though Cimon's support in Athens was still strong enough to see that all the charges would be dropped at the trial. Here we saw Ephialdes rise to become the leading figure in opposition to Cimon's policies, with Pericles also falling in. This opposition would be focused not only on trying to remove Cimon from political affairs, but it also had the Areopagus in its sight, where they were trying to reduce its powers and give more say to the people. We will look at the Areopagus in a little more detail a little later in the episode, where we'll refresh ourselves on its functions, how it changed during the Persian Wars, and how it would eventually look when Ephialdes' attacks on it would succeed. But for now, at this stage in Athens, the aristocratic class had enjoyed somewhat of a resurgence, with the status quo seeming to continue under Cimon. The opposition forming against him was looking to reduce the nobles' hold on power to a degree that had not been experienced yet. But let's get back to events around this growing opposition. Last episode, we saw Cimon was able to argue for Athens to send an army to Sparta to assist them in the Helot revolt that had broken out after the earthquake of 464. 
During the debates, we saw Ephiotes show himself to be completely hostile to Sparta in his argument to not provide any help, where Plutarch has him saying, This Ephiotes opposed, protesting that they ought not to rise up or assist a city that was a rival to Athens, but that being down, it were best to keep her so, and let the pride and arrogance of Sparta be trodden under. But as we saw, Chimon would get his army and would march off to Sparta with 4,000 hoplites. This, though, would end up being a blessing in disguise for Chimon's opponents. As for not long after, Sparta would grow suspicious of the Athenians, in what appears to be a policy shift. The result of this would see the Spartans request the Athenian army to leave Sparta, where Athens would treat this disrespectful conduct as a hostile action. This would not only damage the passive policy towards Sparta that Chimon had encouraged, but he being recognised as the friendliest Athenian political figure towards the Spartans, he would also find his support severely damaged. With the news of the Spartan treatment towards Athens, Ephiotes and his supporters now saw the time to strike had presented itself. Though it isn't entirely clear if it was just this episode over in Sparta that saw opinion in Athens change. No doubt, Athens was extremely angry at the insult and Chimon would have been the most likely political figure to take the blame for it, due to putting Athens in the position for it to occur. However, there were other developments occurring in Athens while Chimon was away, where Ephiotes had been focused on restructuring the Areopagus. If parts of this had been successful while Chimon was away, it could well have seen the political sands in Athens shift even without Sparta's insult. But nevertheless, this insult would have if not seen the political tide turn against Chimon, it would have greatly added to it and probably given momentum to Ephiotes and the supporters behind him. This in turn would see the popular support Chimon had had, almost unopposed for a decade, come to an end. This would also give Chimon's opponents another opportunity. They could rid themselves of Chimon, so that would see him unable to make a comeback within the politics of Athens. The opposition to Chimon also found itself in a position where they would attempt to have an ostracism held while they had the momentum. As we have seen, having someone ostracised wasn't as simple as nominating someone and voting. Firstly, it had to be proposed that an ostracism be held, where that motion could then be voted on and if successful, the ostracism would be held the following year. Here again, it wouldn't be as simple as putting Chimon forward. In theory, all public figures were able to be voted for though in practice, most were fully aware of the political situation of the time, and only a few figures had the focus of the people. So, if those winning an ostracism to be held misjudged the political situation, it could turn out to be disastrous. In this instance, Athens would vote for an ostracism to be held, and we can be sure Ephiotes and Pericles would have been extremely active in ensuring the people's opinions were going to go against Chimon. Plutarch would tell us that the whole episode around Sparta's rejection of Athens' help, once within Spartan lands, would be at the core for the reason that it would be Chimon's name that would feature most frequently on the ostraca that would be cast. As we have seen, Athenian politics can be quite fickle. A figure who would be seen to have unending support and achieve so much for the polis can come undone in such a short period. All it takes is one misstep for opinion to turn against them. So it was the case with Chimon, who had been an important figure in Athens' development coming out of the Persian invasions. He would be active in the highest roles of Athenian politics for almost 20 years. Now though, opinion had shifted, a new generation would come to take the reins and steer Athens forward. However, this wouldn't be the last that we hear of Chimon, as he would end up returning to Athens once his 10 years had been completed. Now, I want to turn to the changes that Ephiotes, Pericles and their supporters would put into effect. It appears some of what may have been occurring could well have been in motion while Chimon was still in Athens, though most of these changes would be in full effect by 461 and 460. Have you been enjoying the series and thinking of supporting the show in some way? Casting Through Ancient Greece is over on Patreon, where we have been providing supporters with monthly bonus episodes, where we look at past topics in more detail and isolation. So far we have revisited the Bronze Age of Greece, looking at art, trade connections, warfare, and a number of other topics. We then advanced into the Archaic Period, where we spent some time exploring the little-known Latin War, the Olympic Games, emergence of the Hoplite, and other areas. This then saw us turn to doing a three-part series on the epic poet Homer, 
where we also explore the two epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey, that are credited to him. Currently, we're exploring the development of both Sparta and Athens in more detail. We are beginning by focusing on their origin myths, which saw us first look at the return of the Heraclidae, which sought to explain the Spartans' rightful possession of their lands. The latest bonus episode to come out then has us turning to the origin myths explaining the birth of Athens and its development of many of the elements that would come to define it in classical times. This would see the gods competing for favour with the city, while then the stories around the hero Theseus would explain later developments. If you're interested in gaining access to these bonus episodes, please consider heading over to the Casting Through Ancient Greece Patreon page. Not only will you get monthly bonus episodes, but you'll receive early access, ad-free episodes, plus quarterly video series updates about what's been happening in the series, where we also run competitions. Other options also include access to fully referenced transcripts of the series episodes, as well as a forum where members' questions are answered every month via video. Alternatively, you can visit the Casting Through Ancient Greece website, where you can find the Patreon link as well as other ways to help support the series grow when clicking on the support the series button. Thank you all for listening to the series and I look forward to perhaps seeing you over on Patreon. By far and away the biggest change that occurred in the political constitution with this shift in influence had to do with the Areopagus, one of the oldest institutions in Athens before any elements of democracy would develop. So I think it might be helpful to refresh ourselves on the Areopagus and its function before Ephialdes could enact change on it. At its core, the Areopagus was an aristocratic institution that was made up of past archons. These archons held the top positions within Athens, with three of these positions being senior roles, while there were another six positions that served under them. Once these archons had completed their service, which was normally one year, they would then be eligible to sit on the Areopagus where they would hold membership for life. In its earliest times and into the archaic period, the men that held these archon positions, and in turn made up the Areopagus, were all drawn from the Athenian Eupatridae, this being the noble class within Athens. This council had enormous influence in the running of the polis and appears to be the main driving force behind Athenian affairs, and had full authority in the dispensing of punishment for the disorderly. The importance of this council is reflected in many ancient sources, where this group is referred to as being the guardians of the laws. Even though this council received new members every year, its political outlook varied very little, since all of its members were drawn from the same noble class, all with similar political interests. It also appears that the council of the Areopagus would have been able to influence the policies the archons of the time were following since these archons would be looking forward to their membership within this council and would have hardly wanted to jeopardise their entry into it. Also reinforcing this conservatism was the fact that it was the Areopagus that elected the future archons, and therefore their future members. They would have had their eyes on those who would look to preserve their interests. So what we have seen of this council during its early history is that it was maintaining the interests of the noble class within Athens. Due to their common political interests as a class, this system of Archons and the Areopagus would have been extremely conservative. But as we have seen, events and discontent within other classes, almost leading to civil war, would see reforms taking place to try and bring order back into the population. For the most part, the role of the Areopagus would remain the same through the Archaic period, though with other parts of the constitution going through reforms, which would impact it. A couple of changes that would have some impact on it was as these reforms continued, more people within Athens would have the ability to serve as archons. It was no longer just for the Eupatridae. Also added to this, instead of the Areopagus electing the archons for each year, there would be names put forward from the various deems that instead of being elected were chosen by lot, making this a random selection of officials. This would see the nobles of the Areopagus unable to stack their future membership with their chosen candidates. This opening of the office of Archon to other class levels, though the lowest classes were still exempt, would now see a broader range of political interests enter into the Areopagus, which would come to challenge its conservative nature. However, with the crisis of the Persian invasion, we would find that the Areopagus was able to revert its focus back to older times and look to build back its aristocratic nature. Aristotle will record in the Athenian constitution that after the Persian Wars, the Areopagus was able to recover its strength. 
This would not be through any formal change in the political system, but rather through public confidence. As during 480 BC, when Persian forces were advancing into Attica, Athens was in a panic. It would be the Areopagus that would see an organised evacuation to Salamis and the Peloponnese would take place. They would also ensure that each man received enough money to support their families through this period. The prestige of the council would be raised up through this period and would continue to be the dominant political organ in the years after the war. Crisis and wars tend to have a conservative effect. Society looking to preserve itself while all the competing factions within would all share a common enemy. Though this re-emergence of the Areopagus to its conservative, aristocratic roots would not continue on into the 450s, as the reforms of Ephialdes would come to change the council dramatically. It is important to note here that the reforms that would be focused on the Areopagus would lead to power that rested with the Eupatridae as being diminished in favour of the wider Athenian citizenry. Though the democracy that would form, that would come to characterise Athens, would do so as the years would pass. The changes that Ephialdes enacted would open the way for this democracy to form by shifting the power balance within the politics of Athens. Also, all the sources did not agree on who was responsible for the various changes, though one constant seems to be Ephialdes described as laying the way for yet more democratic reforms to take place. For example, in Plutarch's biography of Pericles, who he assigns much greatness to, also says that Ephialdes was the one who broke down the power of the Council of the Areopagus. Obviously, Pericles would also be credited with the changes being enacted, though separating in this early stage who was driving what is hard to discern. We need to remember Pericles would have a long political career, where it would have been easy for later writers to have credited much of the 460 reforms to him, since Ephialdes would have an early departure, which we will get to. Though I do think the fact that Ephialdes being a target for political violence probably does indicate the importance of his role during this period. So I want to read out what the Athenian constitution says regarding the changes Ephialdes would push. As the masses increased, Ephialdes, son of Sophonides, became champion of the people, a man who appeared to be uncorrupt and upright in political matters. He attacked the council of the Areopagus. First, he eliminated many of its members, bringing them to trial for their conduct in office. Then in the Archon ship of Conon, this being in 462-461, he took away from the council all the accretions which gave its guardianship of the constitution, giving some to the council of the 500 and some to the people and to the jury courts. So here it seems Ephialdes was laying the groundwork for these changes to occur, while Chiamon still enjoyed popular support. It appears he was operating within the Areopagus and singling out those who had been acting in a corrupt manner. We even find within Aristotle's constitution that he may have been following the example of Themistocles' work, trying to root out corrupt members. Though when it comes to politics, it is usually one's opponents that are the focus of this sort of policy. Supposedly both of them together would attack the Areopagus with presentations to the Council of the 500 and the Assembly. Now obviously, if this was taking place, it would have had to have been before Themistocles had been exiled, which would mean Ephiodes would have been actively pursuing his aims some ten years earlier. Now before we accept what Aristotle says here, we need to be aware that during the Athenian constitution it does confuse some details and events along the way. So it is unclear if this is one of those moments where he just doesn't make the timeline too clear, as the paragraph relating these events that would have been unfolding over more than a decade, come across as if it was just one moment. If this was in fact unfolding during the late 470s, it appears it may have seen a lot of heat brought onto Themistocles, and may have added to the reasons that his opponents would end up ostracising him. In turn, this may have seen Ephialdes lay low for a while, until an opportunity to attack the Areopagus again presented itself, which would be some ten years later. Anyway, back to what appears to have been taking place in 461. Attacking the members of the Areopagus would have been only one part of ensuring change would occur. Ephialdes would also need to bring into the equation the other organs of the Athenian political system. This we saw brought up in the passage from the constitution that I read out. Here it basically told us 
that much of the power that the Areopagus had accumulated was given to the Council of 500, the people and the courts. The Council of 500 was the old Boule system, which in its current setup, it would be made up of three of the four property classes within Athens citizenry. This would see its members not only made up from the noble classes. A diverse range of political interests would be represented within this council, since it would be made up of 50 citizens from each of the 10 tribes, this seeing its members coming from not just within Athens, but from all parts of Attica. The 50 members from the tribes were not elected, but chosen by lot from all those eligible to serve. The council itself was responsible for setting the agenda for the assembly, and then for the formal execution of the political decisions made at the assembly. With the reforms of Ephiotes, it would now also take on a number of the administrative and judicial functions that the Areopagus had previously held. This would see it now responsible for the state's finances, the navy, cavalry, building projects, trade matters, sacred issues, and welfare. It would also be this council that would put on trial those who held the top offices within the political system once they had finished their terms of service. This to ensure all the decisions they made were in the interests of the polis. Now, we just saw the Council of the 500 set the agenda for the Assembly, and the Assembly is the most likely organ Aristotle is referring to when he says some of the power was given to the people. The Assembly was where all citizens from all classes could attend and vote on items that had been put forward by the Council of 500. By extension, this saw the Assembly with far more power as they now had the authority to vote on aspects that had once been under the control of the Areopagus. Between the Assembly and the Council of 500, giving more authority to these functions would see a far more democratic system develop, as more of the Athenian citizenry were involved in the decision-making process. This would also see not just the highest levels of the Athenian class structure being looked out for, now all levels of wealth and class were able to influence policy in one way or another. This would also see a much more direct form of democracy develop than what we are used to today. For example, if a motion of going to war was put forward to the assembly, which was done on a number of occasions, it wasn't just a representative voting on it, to whom would be removed from the direct consequences of this decision, i.e. going to fight the war. In a direct democracy, it was likely those present at the assembly who would allow the war to take place would also be the ones who would be fighting it. So as you can see, in this sense, the decisions made here could have a very direct implications on the lives of those casting their individual votes. We probably need to be cautious in how far we go in crediting all of these changes to Ephialdes. It would appear, from what we have seen, that he did play a big role in initially attacking and exposing the Areopagus, which would have seen the Council of 500 and the Assembly in a position to push for change and continue the momentum against the Areopagus. The Areopagus would still function, though in a much more reduced capacity. They would still retain a high court and would try those accused of murder and for religious offences. It is unclear how long it took for all these changes to have been in place, but what Ephiotes had begun, and the direction it was heading in, would have created in many enemies from the noble classes, which would result in an act of political violence which had not been seen since the days of Hippias. We would hear that Ephiotes would not live long enough for him to see his radical democracy fully realised. It would be up to others and the institutions that he had helped bring power back to, to continue the momentum he had started. As you can imagine, Ephiotes' actions would see many with motive to see him done away with. Though even with this, what seems to be straightforward motive, the person or persons responsible for his assassination would remain unknown, seeing this being one of history's unsolved murders. However, in cases such as these, there would be a number of theories of who was responsible, beginning in ancient times all the way to ours. One of the earliest sources to mention Ephiotes' assassination would be from Antiphion, a Greek orator and statesman. He would write 40 years after Ephiotes' death. For instance, the murderers of one of your own citizens, Ephiotes, have remained undiscovered to this day. Though we would then have in Aristotle's Athenian constitution, 90 years after the murder, a line that there was no mystery around who his killer was. Ephiotes too was removed by assassination not long afterwards, 
through the agency of Aristodekis of Tanagra. This viewpoint sees Ephialdes' death due to the hatred he would gain from reducing the long-held traditions and control of the Eupatridae. Aristodekus may be the one who carried out the deed, but if this interpretation is correct, then it is very likely that many from this affected class would be guilty of conspiracy of murder. Perhaps with so many involved at this highest of classes, it would be possible to cast doubt on what had happened or protect those involved. By the time of Aristotle's writing, all involved would no longer be living. We also find Diodorus commenting on Ephialdes' assassination, though he appears not so interested in who did it, but pointing out an explanation of why he met his end. In Athens, Ephialdes, the son of Siphonides, who being a popular leader, had provoked the masses to anger against the Areopagites, persuaded the assembly to vote to curtail the power of the Areopagus and to destroy the renowned customs which their fathers had followed. Nevertheless, he did not escape the punishment for attempting such lawlessness, but he was done to death by night, and none ever knew how he lost his life. Finally, I want to highlight one other theory that has been put forward, with the beginning in ancient times. This can be found in Plutarch's work in his Life of Pericles, where he relates the accusation the late 4th, early 3rd century historian Adominius puts forward. He accuses Pericles of being Ephialdes' murderer, with it appearing his desire to have control over the faction, along with jealousy and envy being motives. Though we do find Plutarch dismissing this line of thinking, where he says, how then can one put trust in Idomeneus, who accuses Pericles of assassinating the popular leader, Ephialtes, though he was his friend and partner in his political program, out of mere jealousy and envy for his reputation? These charges he has raked up from some source or another and held them, as if so much venom, against one who was perhaps not in all points irreproachable, but who had a noble disposition and an ambitious spirit wherein no such savage and bestial feelings can have their abode. Just for a little more food for thought on this last theory, the scholar Robert Wallace, in his book Ephialtes and the Areopagus, argues the point that had the person responsible for Ephialtes' assassination come from the Eupatridae, Ephialtes would have been made a martyr, and surely his own faction would have been unending in trying to bring to trial the guilty parties. Because we don't see this taking place in the sources, he then argues it would be plausible that those responsible came from within Ephialdes' own faction. This doesn't necessarily mean it had to be Pericles, though it would be tempting to point the finger at him since he would be the one to benefit the most. Again though, we need to be careful to accept this view out of hand, just on the basis of elements being absent in the sources. As we have seen, there has been a great lack of detail on many things during this interval period. So, it would seem the question on who was responsible for Ephialdes' death still remains an open question today. We may have our theories and what sounds most likely, but the reality is that we have no hard evidence. I think down the track looking a little deeper into this mystery may make an excellent Patreon episode, and I feel this topic would make an excellent question to put forward to our Patreon supporters for an upcoming competition. But anyway, this episode we have covered the change that was occurring in Athenian politics where we introduce ourselves to a couple of more political figures, one who has departed us just after us becoming acquainted with him, the other, Pericles, a figure who would feature very heavily as we move forward. As you can see, there appears to be quite a lot taking place to see the path to direct democracy develop, with it not entirely clear what exactly can be attributed to Ephiodes, Pericles and the institutions. Though, at the very least, Ephiodes would clear the way for many of the reforms to take place, and Pericles would take the reins seeing the institutions develop further. Next episode we are going to turn back to relations between Sparta and Athens, where we will focus on the alliances that had been formed in the wake of the incident of Sparta sending the Athenians home. As we will see, Athens' new interpolis relations would take these hostile attitudes between the two city-states and would see them degenerate further into open conflict. This would lead to what is often called the First Peloponnesian War, not the Great Peloponnesian War that would break out in 431, but a conflict nevertheless that would see Athens and Sparta eventually facing one another on the field of battle. 
Whether we should see this as the First Peloponnesian War and a continuation into what would be the Great Peloponnesian War, we will try and answer in the next episode. Thank you everyone for your continued support and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the show and have been supporting it on Patreon and other various ways. Your contribution is truly helping me grow the series. I would like to give a few shout outs to some new supporters who have joined us over on Patreon. So a big thank you to Chelsea Swartz, Chris Ernst and James Leroy for making the decision to sign up and support the series. I greatly appreciate it. If you have also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button, where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over at the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. I hope you can join me next time when we continue the narrative in the series with episode 59, From Allies to Enemies. <laughs>